And welcome to part two of reading Caciques and Semi-Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. Yesterday, we started part one, Introduction and Theoretical Premises, and um, the introduction starts on page three, and we stopped at chapter two, part C, on page 27, so that's where we'll be picking up from. C. From Taino peoples to the Tainoness of peoples. If, as has been argued to this point, the Rausian concept of a Taino people is fraught with contradictions and unsustainable assumptions, what is the alternative? This is important because there has to be some consensus as to the identity of the people who created and used the potent icons and artifacts that are the central subjects of this book. In agreement with Rodriguez Ramos, I suggest that instead of a normative Taino people, Quote, what existed was a spectrum of Tainones whose diverse representations resulted from the variable negotiations in which at least some of the indigenous peoples of the islands engaged in order to facilitate their interactions while retaining their differences. In some cases, some of the elements of such Tainones show variable syncretism of the ideological narratives that might have been derived from the different ancestral histories of each of the different groups that inhabited the islands where the spectrum was main manifested. The mosaic of syncretism observed at this time is thus the result of the myriad of interactions and negotiations in which those different people were engaged within the islands and with the inhabitants of the surrounding continental regions with which they were interacting, end quote. However, the term Taino has become so ingrained in both popular and academic circles that it is virtually impossible, even foolhardy, to try to eradicate it. In this book, I purport to use the term Taino or Tainoin, to refer to the spectrum or mosaic of social groups who express, negotiate, and contest in various ways their Tainones and who participate with various degrees of intensity in becoming and being Tainoin. Used in this sense, the term Taino, Tainoin, or Tainones also acknowledge that the natives' religious concepts and associated material culture had multiple ancestral sources. Being multi authored slash multi sourced, means that in every generation, aspects or elements, even bodies, of theological and philosophical concept that inform attitudes and ways of engaging socially and the materials that mediate within and between humans are selectively appropriated via mimicry, synthesis, or syncretism and made, quote, their own, end quote, by social groups. Such bodies of knowledge and materials are acquired from a broad reservoir that has had different historical origins. The issue of how much Tainoness is needed to be identified as becoming Tainoin as a material object or as a person, social group, and further up the scale is a matter of identity formation and social relations and of what is available in the reservoir of ideas, materials, and practices that can be co-opted for various ends that are, of course, historically contingent. Philip Lays and others have dealt with precisely this same have dealt with precisely the same issues when examining the plurality, plura, plurality of peoples and ethnicities of the Niger Delta in West Africa, especially in relation to art and iconography. The material cultures of the peoples of the Niger Delta, says Lace, were critical, quote, were critical in the historical processes of both defining and being defined by the Delta populations, end quote, much in the same way that objects of political religious art, semi-icons, that we shall examine in this book were defining and being defined by the societies inhabiting this region from eastern Cuba, the Bahamas, Hispaniola, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Lace also speaks of the complex mosaic of languages, cultures, and ethnicities of the Delta inhabitants, of their diverse points of origin, and the complex ways of interaction within and between social groups that are constantly deconstructing and reconstructing identities. Lays observed that Quote, notions of primordiality and cultural conservatism on the one hand and of inventiveness and cultural convergence on the other are two major ways of thinking about identity formation, end quote. In the case of the former pair, primordiality, conservative, conservatism, with their stress on descent, the ethnic boundaries are defined in reference to blood ties leading to a common ancestry and to an, quote, innate shared tradition of customs and beliefs, end quote. On the other hand, as Lace noted, inventiveness and cultural conversion stress collaterality, where 
quote, boundaries are more reliant on opposing to surrounding populations and the cultural differences within a population are fused within a recreated history, end quote. That is, a given ethnic group often discovers and rediscovers itself, quote, by assimilating past populations with an eye toward legitimizing its history on par with that of present-day neighbors. A newly defined ethnic group may, by the very nature of the opposition that it creates, quickly arrive at a self-definition that insists, insists on its primordial status, end quote. That is, to insist on their cultural and even temporal priority among all Delta populations, even if in fact they were not the first. If in theory cultural identities are formed in many different ways, quote, in practice the processes blend and can be hotly contested, end quote. These are the kinds of processes that I would argue are also operating in the contestation of being more or less Tainoan on the various configurations that Tainoness can be or become. Moreover, Lays observed for the Niger Delta what he calls a remarkable feature of cultural identity formation, which ought to at least be considered with regard to the Tainoness of the natives being studied here. Quote, Seemingly, similar people see themselves as being different, and conversely, people defining themselves as having one culture may be more different from each other than they are from those that they see as belonging to other ethnic groups. We have no simple answer as to why this occurs, particularly where populations are in intimate contact with each other, even intermarrying. The Delta people provide us a good example of how conservatism and cultural change can operate at the same time and thus suggest one type of resolution, end quote. This observation is also echoed by Martha Anderson and Philip Peake, who note that, quote, contiguous ethnic groups are never as different from each other as they believe themselves to be. Nevertheless, as is readily observed, the Igbo are clearly more Igbo than the Yoruba, end quote, and then ask, quote, what accounts for this difference, end quote. The author starts with the premise that the arts, quote, reflect ethnic identity and that both content and form will be used to demonstrate change affiliation and difference a cultural complex of a myriad of elements, any and all of which may be altered, end quote. Like these authors, this book also intends to contribute to questions of cultural identity as it is negotiated and contested, webs of social relations among rulers, through the means of what must be regarded as a religious art that has serious personal and political consequences in how natives interact and display Tainones. Identity, as intimated in the quote above by Rodriguez Ramos, is always in the state of becoming, of being negotiated and contested. The kind of Tainoness on which I am focusing from here on involves peoples who interact through a basic matrix of religious beliefs and practices enshrined in semiism that inform their behaviors, values, attitudes, and motivations to themselves and to, quote, others, end quote, including strangers, and that, importantly, also implicate the action of formerly specific and potent art objects being imbued with supernatural power. It is a web of social relations engaging humans and their potent objects that creates diverse forms and contexts defining the Tainones of native actors. These semi-objects can be deployed, as Anderson and Peake suggest, for the Delta peoples as personal as well as ethnic markers of sorts. But more than that, they also elicit constructed memories that constantly recapitulate their cultural priority, primordiality, and conservatism and at once motivate cultural inventiveness and convergence. The interesting thing occurs when, quote, others, end quote, the opposites, enter into relationships with different understandings of Tainones or of what it is to become Tainioan. That is precisely where this book culminates with the natives' sense of identity grounded in Tainones and the Spaniards' own sense of identity, each probing and adjusting, and each reacting and battling their mutual misconceptions of Castilianness and Tainones. In the Hispaniolan and Cuban cases discussed in Part 5, convergence, assimilation, and difference, resistance, syncretism and anti-syncretism will be treated in detail. However, there is a road to be traveled before reaching that juncture. Next, it is useful to discuss the above noted webs of interaction from the perspective of what is known about descent, inheritance, and secession among 16th century natives of the Greater Antilles. Section D. Descent, Inheritance, and Secession in the 16th Century Greater Antilles. Webs of social relationships are, of course, extremely diverse and reticulate in any society, ranging from those established by blood and affine relation 
relations to those between trading or ritual partners, example, godparents, godchildren, between total strangers, and between the living and their deceased relatives. Among the natives, particularly in Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, ritual exchanges of names to cement friendships, pacts, and alliances, guatiao, were frequently reported by the Spanish and did extend to total strangers. Natives and Spaniards exchanged names with each other for a variety of reasons, as we shall see later in parts 4 and 5. Moreover, kinship and descent also apply to numinous icons imbued with semi-potency, making the network of social relations among and between human and non-human beings that much richer. This section intends to provide a summary of what is known thus far about kinship, descent, inheritance, and secession among the ethno-historic natives in the time of Columbus. There is no question that these are the key to bu- these are the key building blocks of sociality of what Rodriguez Ramos and I call quote end quote dainones. Sadly, the Spaniards never bothered to collect or write about native kinship terminology. Not surprisingly, most of the available information has to do with the inheritance of the office or estate of cacique, male chief, or cacica, female chief, or chiefess. Inheritance of the estate usually refers to the right to rule, and only in one case is there an explicit and specific reference from Hispaniola to the bequest of material goods or heirlooms upon the death of a chief. This is important because the heir to the office is not necessarily also the beneficiary of the deceased's wealth. The Spaniards' comments on rules of inheritance and secession were mostly restricted to the political elite, the caciques and itainos or nobles. Next to nothing is really known about the quote common end quote person. Or Naboria. To date, the best and most recent analyses on secession are those of Curet, Keegan, and Jali Sued Badillo. However, there is still considerable, considerable dispute on how the 16th century chronicles are to be assessed and interpreted as exemplified in the recent exchange between Keegan and Curet in the Ethno History Journal. Curet makes the plausible argument that the rules of secession among the natives of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico were most likely to be based on customary law. He makes the critical observation that the transmission of office is not automatic or enshrined in law, but is flexible and adapting to existing social and political conditions. Quote, the manipulation of the automatic rules can happen mainly under three circumstances, when there are a number of political factions struggling for power, when the automatic successor is not fit for the position under normal circumstances, and where one candidate is better positioned to deal with the situation, end quote. The key sources of ethno-historic data are Pedro Martir de Angleria, Bartolomé de la Casa, and Gonzalo Fernández de o- Oviedo y Valdez, all of whom wrote early in the 16th century and furnished versions of the rules of secession. Las Casas, who arrived in Hispaniola in 1502, noted that the chief's sister was to inherit the office because his sister's children shared the chief's own bloodline, whereas this could not be demonstrated with his own children. Hence, it would seem that descent is congruent with matrilineality. Although Martil never set foot in the Caribbean, he was not only the earliest chronicler between 1492 and 1525, but was also in an, in an advantageous position to interview ocular witnesses or their written communiques to the Spanish court. Martí provided a somewhat more complicated scenario than Las Casas. He noted that A, the preferred candidate for secession was the firstborn son of the eldest sister of the cacique, B, failing that, the office would go to the son of the next eldest sister, and so on down to the son of the youngest sister. C, if the cacique had no sister or sister's children, then the office passed to the cacique's brothers. D, in the absence of brothers, the office would be inherited by the cacique's sons. E, and failing all of the above, the office was passed to the person who had the reputation of being the most powerful. The first two rules suggest, suggest a preferential matrilineal secession. The alternative route, or C, still retains the office within the cacique's family slash lineage, although the heir's own children would not belong to their father's matriline. Alternative D also retains the office within the cacique's family, but inherited suggests patrilineality. Finally, the alternative E suggests that there was a way for a stranger outside any line of descent to achieve the office of cacique. Oviedo presents a different, seemingly contradictory account. The cacigazo was to be inherited by A, the eldest son, primogenitor, of any of the cacique's wives. B, if after inheritance, inheriting the office, the son had no children of his own, 
the estate would pass on to the cacique's sister's daughter or son, quote, since this child would be more certainly a true descendant of the family line, end quote. However, Oviedo also added two further options. C, if the cacique had no offspring, his sister's son would not inherit the estate if he had a brother by the same father. Or instead, D, if the cacique had no offspring, then, quote, the relative closest to the mother would inherit holdings derived from the chief's mother, end quote. Contrary to Las Casas and Martid, the first rule suggests patrilineal inheritance, while the second suggests matrilineal inheritance. The latter two options, CD, as Keegan would say, keep the office within the cacique's family. In addition, as Guret noted, inheritance rules C and D, while suggestive of ambilineal inheritance, the estates were inherited from both sides and kept separate, cannot account for, quote, why there are two versions of what happened when the chief had no sons, end quote. The discrepancies among these three chroniclers' accounts partially have to do with differences in the timing and the situations in which these data were recorded. Unusually, Martir identified his source, Andres Morales, an experienced navigation pilot who was ordered by Governor Nicolás de Ovando to reconnoiter Hispaniola. In 1508, Morales drafted the first map identifying some topographic features, toponyms delineating native regions, and Spanish towns and then published it in 1516. Martid had used the map's information for his first three vo volumes of the De Orbe Novo de Cades, published in 1514. However, it is not known from whom Morales obtained the information and where in Hispaniola. Bartolomé de la Casa, who arrived on the Hispaniolan scene early enough, in 1502, is generally regarded as the chronicler most knowledgeable and sympathetic to the natives' way of life and cultures. He was a first-hand participant in and witness to many of the historic events in both Cuba and Hispaniola. Still, of the three chroniclers under consideration, Las Casas wrote the least on the matter of secession or inheritance. Perhaps the reason for this is because Las Casas wrote Historia de las Indias, 1552-1561, to when he was an elderly man, in, this late seven, in his late 70s and early 80s, thus relying on documents and fading memories. Oviedo, on the other hand, arrived at Santo Domingo in 1523, exactly 20 years after the collapse of the Las Casicas in the Higüey region, Higüe region of Hispaniola, almost a decade after the rebellion of the caciques of Puerto Rico from 1510 to 1511, and after the severe famine of 1495 to 1496 and the devastating smallpox epidemic, epidemic of January 1519. By 1523, it's more than likely that the native customs of inheritance of the office, not to mention the estate, had adjusted to the new and radically changed circumstances. Indians native to Yucatan, the Lesser Antilles, the northern coast of South America, and the Isthmian region, Panama, Colombia, had been captured as slaves or held in encomienda as assignment and resettled in the greater Antilles, as were African slaves raised in the Iberian Peninsula or captured in Western Africa. All of this adding to the multicultural mix of potential influences in the Greater Antilles. In sum, Oviedo's account must be taken very cautiously, not the least because he was arguably the most racist and Hispanocentric of all the major Spanish chroniclers. Another problem was the tendency of some chroniclers to extrapolate what they learned from a given locale to a whole island, to groups of islands, and even to the entire West Indies. Furthermore, the sources of information regularly remained anonymous. Martí's revelation of his source, Andrés Morales, is exceptional. Were the informants from the same ethnic group, the same polity, or the accounts synthesized from diverse sociocultural groups? Were the rules described based on ideals or actual practice? I agree with Puret that it is likely the Spaniards translated what, in effect, were customary laws into a, sequ into a set sequential order of preferences based on, quote, strict laws a la European style, end quote, that are, quote, not characteristic of most chiefdoms, end quote, in the Americas. On the other hand, this does not imply that the chroniclers were incapable of comprehending complex secession rules. In theory, royal secession in the 15th century Iberian Peninsula were as complex and could be as mind-boggling, being twisted and manipulated to fit the purpose, as anything they could have heard from native Hispaniolans. It's interesting to note, as Keegan observed, that only Oviedo described primogenitor in Hispaniola, also a common secession rule among European monarchs. Yet, I hasten to add, even in the Iberian Palisola, exceptions abound. The future Queen Isabella of Castile, 
inherited her crown against the will of her reigning half-brother Enrique, or Henry IV, who insisted, who instead preferred his bastard daughter Juana, la Beltraneja. After Enrique IV's death in 1474, a war of secession ensued, and Isabella, supported by her faction of nobles, was recognized as the Queen of Castile and Leon in 1479. Let us turn to modern scholarly interpretations. On the basis of the above chroniclers, especially Martir, Rouse concluded that the office of cacique was inherited matrilineally and that the population generally practiced a patrilocal residence pattern, quote, despite the matrilineal inheritance, end quote. Roberto Casa, a historian from the Dominican Republic, concluded that the pattern of secession and inheritance reflected a transition from matrilineal to patrilineal that ultimately created a bilineal or ambilineal pattern of secession. He argued that these patterns applied to caciques, leaving open the possibility that the rule could be different for the commoners. As Curet noted, Casa's arguments relied far more on ethnographic, ethnographic analogies to modern South American Indians than to 16th century Spanish documents. Puerto Rican ethno-historian Halid Suez Badillo, like Casa, also concluded that the different secession rules described by the chroniclers reflected transition from matrilineality to patrilineality, the latter resulting from Hispanic influence. Francisco Moscoso, another Puerto Rican historian, concludes that there was a strong emphasis on matrilineal secession. All of these scholars, except Curet, ascribe patrilineality and primogenitor to European influence and argue that the original pre-Columbian secession rule was matrilineal. William Keegan also concluded that the Taino chiefs exhibited matrilineality, that descent was traced through the matrilineal line. Keegan and Morgan D. McLaughlin believe that the chronicler's references to patrilineality were, quote, an exceptional practice that may have been brought about by the Spanish disruption of the indigenous social system, end quote. Furthermore, attempts by Keegan to resolve the paradox of having a matrilineal descent while also practicing patrilocal postmarital residence are dealt with by suggesting that the Taino chiefdoms were characterized by viri avunculocality, i.e., after marriage, the husband and his wife set up permanent residence with his maternal uncle. This practice, according to Keegan, would apply mostly to the elite. Keegan and McLaughlin then use this premise to account for the archaeological pattern of establishing new settlements in several of the islands of the southern Bahamian archipelago. This is a distinct possibility, but it hinges on a hypothesis that cannot be tested. The pattern of establishing new settlements does correlate with Vidi Avunculocality, but a correlation does not necessarily entail causality. Keegan's argument is essentially circular. Vidi of Unculocality explains the pattern of establishing new settlements that are, in turn, explained by Vidi of Unculocality. Other explanations can compete with Vidi of Unculocality to account for the observed archaeological settlement pattern. In a recent paper, a reply to Curet's critique, Keegan stands firm by his matrilineal descent and Vidi of Unculocal postmarital residence thesis, but without really adding any new data to further his position. Somewhat less dogmatic is the view of Samuel Wilson. Although he thought that the native system was predominantly matrilineal, he was conscious that kinship, secession, inheritance, and postmarital residential patterns among the natives of Hispaniola were much more complex than had previously been understood. Curet, on the other hand, argued that all of these scholars were extrapolating to all, quote, Taino land, end quote, rules of secession that most likely were applied in only some areas of Hispaniola. He rightly questions the assumed equivalency between rules of secession of office and the rule of matri patri ambilineal descent. And as I noticed earlier, I would also add that the inheritance of the office is, dif is a different matter than the inheritance bequest of goods and heirlooms, as we shall examine in, later, in detail later in this book. Curet further objects to the extrapolation of rules that are applicable to the chiefly elite to the rest of the population and goes on to discuss with examples why his critique is well-grounded. In his reply to Keegan, Curet did, quote, not deny that some matrilineal idealized rules of secession may have been present among some Caribbean polities, end quote. Rather, his key points were, quote, one, rules of secession should not be equated at priory with rules of descent without the appropriate evidence. Two, cultural, social variability existed in the Caribbean, and we have to determine the appropriateness of these rules for our case study. And three, rules of secession are not strict, but flexible, open to manipulation, and we should not expect that they were always followed, as the chronicler suggests. 
Additionally, rules of secession are not ahistorical, but they are heavily influenced by individuals, competing factions, and historical conditions, end quote. In short, Guret takes a much more relativistic position in contrast to the more normative rule of law perspective taken by Keegan and others mentioned above. There is one thing that cannot be emphasized enough. The chroniclers were recording the information about the various alternative routes of secession for caciques, mostly from Hispaniola, at a time of heightened strife and stress. Not just political, but all around. Economics, health, social relations, religions, etc. I strongly suspect that most of the rules the Spaniards were writing down from native informants in Hispaniola were not just the preferred routes of secession established by customary law, but also others, so sa such as Oviedo's discrepant rules, that were being implemented ad hoc. New or rarely invoked secession routes would make sense in the face of the brutal imprisonment, killing, and execution, not just of the ruling caciques, but also of many of the preferred heirs. Even by the time Morales obtained the information relayed by Martin shortly before 1508, all five of the most important cacicazos had already collapsed under Spanish military conquest. Even the Caicimu chiefdom, or more likely several peer polities of the Higüey region, in the east of the island had collapsed in 1504 when the last battle of Higüey concluded. It is in this context that I believe the rules of secession should be analyzed, a period of sustained, repeated, severe crises, a time of native chaos brought about by a power vacuum, a time when many, if not most, of the heirs were simply unavailable to fulfill their inheritance. Such circumstances also provided unique opportunities for traditionally competing political factions from within and without a polity to create ad hoc rules or to twist, amend, or work around traditional customary law. This is not to say that all the rules noted by the chroniclers were ad hoc and without reference to tradition, but merely to point out that when the Spanish were taking the information from natives, it's quite possible that they were explaining not only traditional rules from the past, but also any and all rules that were at the moment being invoked as a result of the power vacuums created by the Spanish conquistadors. The corollary to this assertion is that whenever such circumstances of severe political crises arose, including those in pre-Columbian times, it would be expected that traditional or customary inheritance to secession laws would be severely tested and very likely revised. All the scholars have brought to view sufficient cases from Hispaniola and Puerto Rico to suggest that secession throughout the matrilineal line did take place, but exceptions to this just as often imply the matrilineality was neither the dominant nor the only form. As Curet insists, rules of secession were far more flexible than assumed. There are only a handful of actual cases of secession involving specific individuals that illustrate the variety of practices in place, keeping in mind that most of these were recorded at a time when polities, entire casigazos, had collapsed or were collapsing all around. In Hispaniola, a man named Guarionez succeeded his father as the principal chief of Gallabo, a chiefdom found in the Magua, meaning Large Valley, region that the Spanish labeled La Vega Real. Guarionesh's father was already dead, presumably long before the Spanish arrived, and hence a pre-contact customary law. Here I agree with Curet that it is unlikely that Guarionesh had inherited the chiefdom from his father because the Spanish had simply assumed that the Hispanic-style rule of promogeniture applied to this case, as Keegan suggested. Another instance is the cacique of the Casimu region in the southeastern Hispaniola, the, the cacique, Cayacoa, was succeeded by his wife, later baptized in the Spanish style as Ines de Cayacoa, with the preposition de meaning belonging or married to, before the first battle of Higüe took place in 1503. In this instance, the choice was to keep the office within the cacique's immediate family, but this choice is not an instance of matrilineal inheritance. Cacique Caonabo is an entirely different case. He accessed the office of principal cacique of the region of Maguana, or, quote, not large, quote, valley, encompassing the Cibao Mountains, through personal achievement. Caonabo was, as Keegan noted, a stranger cacique. His birthplace was in the Luqueo Islands, Bahamas. Chronicler Las Casas, in his Apologetica Historia, specifically wrote, quote, The fourth king of Hispaniola was Caonabo, last syllable stress, who ruled the province called Maguana, Coterminius or sharing his borders with Xaragua or Jaragua. He was a most valorous and esforzado, backed by the force of law, who had gravitas and authority and who, as those of us who came there, being Hispaniola, at the beginning understood belonging to the Luqueo National, belonging to the new, blah, 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 blah. Let's try that again. Belonged to the Luqueo Nation, <laughs> 
a natural born in of the islands of the Luqueños who migrated from there to here, here being, again, Hispaniola. And because he was singled out as a man of war and peace, he had become king of that province and was highly esteemed by all, end quote. It seems to me unwarranted to interpret this passage as anything other than what it states. Gaunabo achieved this status for exactly what Las Casas and other chroniclers said. He was a, quote, noble man in war and in times of peace, end quote. Oviedo added that, quote, Gaunabo married Ana Caona, sister of Cacique Bejequio, being a principal Caribe, he came to the island of Hispaniola as an adventurer captain, and being the person that he was, a principal, he married Anacaona, making his principal residence where now is the Spanish village of San Juan de la Maguana, end quote. Oviedo labeled him a Carib, not in the sense of ethnic or linguistic affiliation, but rather for actively and militarily conspiring against the Spanish. Such a label brought about all the connotations of uncivilized savagery that gave the Spaniards a legal justification to wield a, quote, just war, end quote, and thus the right to enslave him or carry a su summary execution. Cacique Bejequio was, by most contemporary accounts, the most powerful of all caciques at the time, ruling the large cacigazo of Bainoa in southwestern Hispaniola. He resided in a province, or perhaps a village, known as Jaragua, near today's Lake Enriquillo in Haiti. Although part of Caonabo's newfound chiefly power resulted from becoming Bejequio's brother-in-law, the reason that such a high-powered marriage was arranged in the first place had to be because Caonabo's achieved reputation made him a most desirable asset. Like Curet, but unlike Keegan, I do not see any documentary evidence to suggest that Caonabo was one of a set of, quote, matrilineal nephews of the chief, end quote, who succeed succeeded to office by competing against other nephew candidates for the job and determined to be the, quote, best fit, end quote. I concur with Curet that Keegan's interpretations, quote, would all sound adequate were it not for the lack of hard evidence, end quote. Keegan's is a plausible hypothesis, but one that is not testable unless new ethno-historic documents emerge to support it. Bejequio himself was succeeded by his sister Anacaona, who, in turn, may have been succeeded by her nephew, Guaurocuya. Guaurocuya. As Curet noted, Bejequio and Anacaona were on relatively good terms with the Spanish for some time. When Bejequio died, perhaps probably from natural causes, Anacaona inherited the chiefdom of Bainoa and took up residence in Jaragua. This occurred just after the Spanish armies had destroyed her husband's, Caonabo's, chiefdom of Maguana, and after Caonabo had died, along with all hands, in a ship that sank at La Isabela Bay during a hurricane. Anacaona's ascension is not an option in the rules provided by the chroniclers summarized above, i.e. inheritance by the chief's sister rather than by her offspring. In this instance, the office, and presumably part of the estate, would remain, as Keegan likes to say, quote, in the family, end quote, of the chief, but it is still possible that she inherited the position because she may have been perceived as the best or most fit option given the circumstances. Her rule was not to last, however. In 1503, Governor Nicolás de Ovando had sur surreptitiously given orders to burn the cane, the cacique's house, where between 40 and 80 subordinated or allied caciques loyal to Anacaona were assembled, with the pretext that new negotiations of their tributary conditions would ensue. Anacaona herself was imprisoned for three months and then hanged to death. Cacique Guarocoya, Guarocaya, or Guarocuya, a nephew of Anacaona, who perhaps inherited her office, rose to arms in the nearby Bauruco Highlands and led a losing battle against Governor Ovando's forces. He, too, was executed by hanging. The natives' rebellion continued to spread to other areas in the Bainoa region, to Guajaba on the north, to Sabana de Janiguayaba to the west, and to the peninsula of Guacayarima in southwestern Haiti. Let us examine two other examples of secession through matrilineal routes, both from Puerto Rico. One of the more influential caciques when Juan Ponce de Leon began the colonization of Puerto Rico in 1508 was Agüevana I, nicknamed El Grande or the Great One by the Spanish. Agüevana ruled in the southwestern region of the island, which came to be known as Guainia. His mother was identified as a chiefess and noblewoman, Casica Doña, and as having such sway on Agüevana's decision-making and negotiations with Ponce de Leon. As Sued Badillo noted, the Spaniards fairly consistently applied the titles of quote, don, quote, for males, and, quote, doña, and, quote, for female, to those natives who were chiefly, who were of chiefly descent or high noble status, probably Nitainos with connections to chiefly lines. 
The Nitainos, or lesser subordinated chiefs, were identified as capitanes, or captains. Agüevana's mother was baptized Doña Ines. Oviedo, Oviedo, however, used both titles to refer to her, Casica Doña Ines, which raises the issue of whether she was given the title of Casica by the Spanish just because she was the mother of a legitimate chief or because she was a legitimate Casica who delegated public political power to her son. In any event, Agüevana the first mother was a highly influential political figure. Oviedo said that Agüevana was, quote, very obedient to his mother, end quote, and that she was a woman who was, quote, prudent in counseling Agüevana and the Indians that they be good friends with the Christians if they did not all want to die in their hands, end quote. Doña Ines was well informed of the Spanish victories over the powerful Casigazos of Hispaniola, the last one, Casimu Higüe, defeated just four years earlier. When Ponce de Leon met Ines, she was married to Don Francisco, who was not identified as a cacique. Don Francisco was also the stepfather, not the biological father, of Agüevana I. Doña Ines had a brother identified as a hidalgo, a knight or nobleman, named Luis de Añasco, who in other documents is identified as a cacique. Añasco was either his surname or, more likely, referred to the region where he ruled. In 1510, Doña Ines and Agüevana I both died of natural causes. Oviedo wrote that, quote, Heredó el, sen el señorío un hermano suyo, end quote. The estate was inherited by a brother of his, also named Agüevana. From whom Agüevana I inherited the office is not mentioned and remains unknown, but it is clear that his brother Agüevana II inherited the office of chief. This was the chief whom later, in part five, we will meet as the leader of the 1511 rebellion of the caciques of Puerto Rico. The final example is the most detailed and has been well researched by Sued Badillo. It refers to a group of related chiefs and chiefesses of the adjacent Caguas and Turabo Valleys in Puerto Rico who had performed labor and services in a large estate privately owned by the Crown and in partnership with Ponce de Leon, the Royal Hacienda of Toa. This estate was on the Toa Valley where La Plata River flows in what is today the western edge of metropolitan San Juan. The caciques and cacicas of Caguas appear in the Demora work period lists for the Royal Hacienda between 1513 and 1519. Further unpublished documents, located by Suez Barillo in the archives of the Indies in Seville, trace some of their descendants up to 1543. During a work period, each chief would come with his retinue of Nitainos and contingent of Naboria laborers. During these early years, the Cacique of Caguas, for example, would have up to 2,000 Naborias, Alongside the caciques and cacicas of Caguas, chiefs from other regions would also fulfill the demora. Each cacique, however, retained control of his or her subjects. Along with the natives, there is also mention of a few black African slaves residing in Royal Hacienda since 1513. Because each cacique and cacica had his or her own retinue of Naboria, Sued Badillo infers that probably each one ruled the particular dominion or population, población, in the Caguas Turabo Valley region. The Demora lists mention a cacique de Caguas, or Caguash, who was an early ally of Ponce de Leon since 1509 and who loyally continued to provide service and labor at the Royal Hacienda until his death in 1519. As Sued Badillo noted, this cacique of, Cagua of Caguas, the one who maintained a steadfast alliance with Juan Ponce de Leon till his death, is none other than Francisco de Guaybanesh, in one instance called Caiguanesh. Oddly, in the first Demora list of 1513, Guaybanesh appears among Casica Catalina's retinue as being only a, quote, Capitan de la Dicha Casica, end quote, or captain of the said chiefess. Catalina was thus the chiefess of Caguas, according to the 1513 Demora list. She was accompanied by her mother, a very old woman, judging by her name, Yayo, and the nickname given by the Spanish, Casica Vieja, or Old Chiefess. Catalina also had a sister named Doña Maria with the title Doña, indicative of her status as a noblewoman. Assuming that Yayo was a legitimate cacica, it is nevertheless her eldest daughter who clearly was exercising the power to order and command the workforce. If so, it's possible that Yayo may have delegated or relinquished her office in favor of Catalina, perhaps because of infirmity. On the other hand, and perhaps more likely, it could also be that Catalina inherited her office from a from a cacique or cacica on her mother's side rather than directly from her mother. This matrilineal emphasis seems to be supported as Catalina had two daughters who also were to become cacicas later. Their husbands are not even mentioned in the list. In any event, it was Catalina, the cacica of Caguas, 
who was in full authority while Francisco de Guaybanesh was listed in a subordinate position. After 1514, Catalina of Caguas is not mentioned again in the Demoralist and is presumed dead. Instead, it is Francisco de Guaybanesh who is mentioned as the cacique of Caguas. It is clear that Guaybanesh had replaced her, had, quote, replaced her politically, end quote, and that he remained the key chief of Caguas until his death in 1519. What is not clear is whether Guaybanesh was related to Yayo, and thus Catalina and Maria, and if so, in what way. Interestingly, however, members of Catalina's family appear mentioned among Guaybanesh's de Moro group, including old chief this Yayo and the mother of Catalina. At this time in 1514, Yayo is described as Casica, that is, she bears the same rank as Cacique Guaybanesh. In the Demoralists of 1515, Francisco de Guaybanesh is once again mentioned as the Cacique of Caguas. Interestingly, Yayo, the old chiefess, is mentioned not at the head of the Demoralist as would befit her status, but is embedded with the rest of the women. Sued Badillo correctly infers that by this time, quote, the cacique of Caguas had become the most important chiefly figure, in fact, for the Spaniards, although we do not know the mechanisms and avenues that were used to achieve this, end quote. In 1516, the only chief leading the Naboria work group at the Royal Hacienda of Toa was Guaybanesh. The following year, 1517, a new chiefess, Doña Isabel de Cayaguash, enters the scene in the Royal Hacienda of Toa and performs part of Guaybanesh's and forms part of Guaybanesh's retinue. So Ed Badillo uncovered documents demonstrating that she was none other than Cacique Guaybanesh's sister. Doña Isabel of Cayaguash is mentioned along with her two children, Juanico, Little John, de Comerillo, and Doña Maria. The latter is a different Maria, unrelated as far as can be ascertained, to the Yayo Catalina de Caguas line. To distinguish her from the other Maria, she will be called Maria Cayaguash. Sued Badillo calls her Maria de Caguas, but this is confusing because the other Maria is also from Caguas. Juanico de Comerillo had already appeared before in earlier de Morales as one of the capi uh, captains under Cacique Guaybanesh's retinue. Maria Cayaguash would eventually inherit her uncle's Cacique Guaybanesh's office after his death in 1519 when she was only nine years old. In this case, her status as a minor did not affect inheriting the office. The data of Catalina de Caguas as a chiefess receiving her office from or through her mother Yayo and seemingly passing it down to her daughters suggests to Sued Badillo a probable matrilineal descent. But it is the only but it is the other chiefly branch descending from Cacique Francisco Guaybanesh to his nine year old niece Maria Cayaguas that first that fits the quote preferred rule end quote of matrilineal descent noted by both Martir and Las Casas. The case of Catalina is much more difficult to assess because it depends on how one interprets Yayo's status as Casica. Also, because Yayo appears as part of Guaybanesh's retinue in the following work periods, the assumption is that in one way or another, these two chief lines were related, but it is impossible to prove. Casica Maria Cayaguash's mother, Doña Isabel de Cayaguash, was first mentioned in 1513 in the 1513 Demoralist as being in command of 50 workers exploiting the salt mines of Abe, or Yabe in southeastern Puerto Rico. She was first married to the cacique of Calle, and after his death, she married the cacique of Humacao, eastern Puerto Rico, and hence was also known as Isabel Cayaguas of Humacao. Through his sister's marriages, Guaybanesh of Caguas had affine relationships with caciques, brother-in-law, brothers-in-law, who governed a good part of southeastern Puerto Rico. Interestingly, however, the caciques of Humacao and Abe were to remain rebellious against Spanish rule. Their cacicazos were the last area of guerrilla-style resistance long after the island-wide rebellion of caciques in 1511, which Guaybanesh did not join. It is clear that neither Guaybanesh nor Maria Cayaguash had the political muscle to force the caciques of Abe and Humacao to join them in a political alliance with the Spanish forces, despite their affine relationships. The end to the story of Isabel's daughter, Casica Maria Cayaguash, is a sad one. As the heir of the influential cacique of Caguas, Guaybanesh, Maria was the victim of abuses by successive administrators of the Hacienda of Toa, no longer belonging to the crown, particularly, particularly the very powerful treasurer Don Blas Villasante and the wily Majordomo Diego Muriel. They, and probably others too, were all currying her favor because of her command over a large native workforce at the time, late 1520s, when the native demography was collapsing. As noted, in the early days, Cacique Guaybanesh commanded around 2,000 naborias in the hacienda, 
By 1528, there were less than 300. In the attempt to gain her favors, the situation reached scandalous proportions, read sexual exploitation, so much so that the Bishop of Santo Domingo was called in to resolve the situation in 1528. The end result was that to quell all the sexual improprieties, the bishop arranged for Maria Cayaguash to marry the Majordomo Muriel. He accepted the offer in exchange for a suspension of the tax debts he had incurred against the crown. This marriage produced three mestizo children. In 1548, Muriel placed Maria Cayaguash and the children on board a vessel destined for Spain. Tragically, the ship sank and, it, and with it the last of the chiefs of Caguas. These accounts of the chiefs of Hispaniola and Puerto Rico offer a glimpse of the social and political conditions in which some of the informants of the chroniclers were immersed. It shows that various alternate modes of ascension to the office were in play. It is, as Corette argued, not crystal clear that the dominant descent and inheritance rule is matrilineal. Other routes existed. No doubt the Spaniards had a serious impact on matters of secession, but I'm inclined to think that the various alternative routes described by the chroniclers were options that arose from tradition, customary law, as well as from the political crises confronting the native elites. I accept that there are instances that strongly suggest matrilineal secession, but clearly there were important exceptions within and between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. This overview has focused on descent and inheritance among chiefs, taking into consideration only the relationships among human beings. What it has not considered are the social relationships that the chiefs had with non-human beings and other, quote, things, end quote, imbued with semi-vitality. With broad strokes, this, topic's, this topic is explored in the next section. Chapter 3, Webs of Interaction, Human Beings, Other Beings, and Many Things. All webs of sociocultural interaction, whether between oceanic islands or between islands and continents, begin with face-to-face -face relationships between at least two human beings or non-human beings and other, quote, things, end quote, who are embedded and act in a given social and cultural milieu. Relationships between human actors begin at home, within the residential compound of the household. As individuals mature and grow to assume increased responsibility in society, their network or web of relationships will expand beyond the confines of the homestead or village and, for some individuals, into far-flung regions, not to mention those who will leave their natal settlement for good. Throughout their life cycle, humans will keep changing their web of social relations, thus their personal identities will also change accordingly. Ideas and perceptions about self in relation to other beings and things native philosophies of, quote, being, end quote, in the cosmos, lead to distinct ways in which persons are constructed and thus condition the ways in which interactions are affected. Personhood, as a state of being, therefore, becomes an important frame of reference, a theoretical approach to explore and inform about the nature of interactions between human beings and other things in the cosmos, in particular, the semi-icons. In any face-to-face -face social interaction between human actors, some ties or interconnections are strongly developed, maintained, and encouraged to persist, if not expand, over the long run, whereas others are weakly developed, ephemeral, and may contract, dissipate, or disappear over time. The motivations driving human actors towards particular kinds of face-to-face -face relationships are, as might be expected, tremendous, tremendously diverse. Humans place different values on things and on relationships and rank them accordingly. These rank values are thus what motivate different behaviors and social relations. The motivation that rests on such a set on such a set of values, however, however fugitive a concept it may be, is nevertheless the driving force that propels humans into action or inaction toward or away from establishing and maintaining, expanding or even closing the webs of relations. What forces and circumstances motivate the spread of highly valued semi-artifacts is one of the fundamental questions to be addressed in later sections of this book. How the humans and other beings and things are valued, as David Graeber has eloquently elaborated in his book, Toward an Anthropological Theory of Value, is what motivates attitudes and behaviors in all social relationships, most particularly in the Maussian context of giving and receiving and in the Marxist context of production and consumption, i.e., Inalienable, inalienable or alienable things or acts rooted in values. Motivation, whether voluntary or coer coercive, occasional or persistent, drives positive and negative relationships. Be these spurred by kin-based gift reciprocity or avoidance, by dissent and marital alliance, by perceived economic gains, by advantageous, advantageous political maneuverings, or by threats of conflict and aggression.
Graeber said that value is, quote, the way people represent the importance of their own actions to themselves, normally as reflected in one or another socially recognized form. But it is not the forms, structures, themselves that are the source of values. Compare again Marilyn Strathern. Because of her Caesarian, Caesarian starting point, she sees value as a matter of, quote, making visible, end quote. Social relations take on value in the process of being recognized by someone else. According to Nancy Munn's approach, the value in question is ultimately the power to create social relations. The, quote, making visible, end quote, is simply an act of recognition of a value that already exists in potential. Hence, where Strathern stresses visibility, Munn's language is all about potencies, transformative potential human capacities that are ultimately generic and invisible, rather than value being the process of recognition itself, already suspended in social relations, it is the way people who could do almost anything, including creating entirely new sorts of social relation, assess the importance of what they do, in fact, when they're doing it. This is necessarily a social process, but it is always rooted in generic human capacities. By virtue of their power to act, objects imbued with semi, especially those with legendary status, were highly valued and thus motivated human beings to act and react to, and with them, to achieve determined, desired goals. More important, these semis, as iconic beings, are essential in creating certain kinds of social relations that could not exist in human society without their participation. Social relations and interactions are set on a landscape and a seascape, that is both naturally and culturally constructed. Of particular relevance in addressing social-driven webs, such as implied by humans and their semi-artifacts, is that the meanings and values elicited are relational and contextual, that is, perspectival. Interaction requires an understanding of where human beings situate themselves and how they perceive themselves vis-a-vis -vis other non-human beings, physical entities, and other phenomena that populate and constitute the landscape and cosmos. In this guard, in this regard, the multinatural, animistic perspective of the cosmos by native societies is a crucial framework in which to situate the relational analysis and interpretation of human beings and semi beings. It will be demonstrated later that semi icons are not merely indivisible, inert objects circulating along with human beings in a web of social relations. They are instead animated beings, persons with different changing natures, and who are as much agents as they are patients in their relations with human beings. In short, the semi-icon shared the center stage in human interpersonal and intergroup relationships. Together with human beings, semis as objectified forms, artifacts, goods, information, knowledge, and so on are the quote-unquote things that circulated or were transported through the web's pathways, whether by sea, land, or both, and with quote-unquote things, were circulated, and which things were circulated or not is in large measure predicated on the values attached or bestowed to them by all the parties involved. Example, desirable, not desirable, can be gifted or not given. A web is, of course, a metaphor, a human-constructed spatial model that purports to describe the properties and dynamics of pattern formation resulting from, in this case, social interactions between human and non-human beings, i.e. semi. Archaeologists are supposed to tease out the principles that constrain or govern the processes. Example, gift exchange, reciprocity, redistribution, that produce a given web pattern. Example, dendritic, hexagonal, orthogonal, radial. However, since the vast majority of these semi-icons look detailed, lack detailed provenience data, the pattern of pathways connecting different sites between and within islands cannot be specified, and thus the configuration of the web, nodes and pathways or vectors, remains vague. At best, what can be observed is the sphere or area of interaction. By definition, a strong, persistent, socially driven web that extends between islands denies the assumed or conventional idea that islands, in the Latin sense of insula, are uniquely suited laboratories to study evolution and historical development because of their presumed relative isolation and thus treatable as closed systems. Some, perhaps most archaeologists working in oceanic islands would now likely argue that whether particular islands or archipel archipelagic groups 
our more open or more closed social systems is for archaeology to demonstrate and that what ought to be rigorously defined and analyzed is precisely the varying kinds and degrees of social connectivity between islands and sets of islands. Oceans are not inherently barriers or negative space, a point made by Donald Lathrop for the Caribbean more than two decades ago. Ultimately, socially driven webs can and do transcend physical geographic boundaries. It may be argued that if there is anything at all that distinguishes island from continental archaeologists, archaeologies, it is to be found in the one inescapable constraint imposed on a human-driven web of interaction, the keynotes of interaction, the starting, staging, and ending points for the flow of human and material culture through the web cannot be placed on oceans for obvious reasons. Among non-Western pre-industrial societies, these nodes must be land-based or at least very near land-based, like wetlands. In contrast, in, quote, islands and continents, end quote, surrounded by seasonal freshwater oceans, humans have choices as to where to situate and build land-based islands for settlement and gardening. Often, these artificially engineered continental islands are also connected by raised causeways, analogs to the canoeing lanes in the Caribbean Sea. It's striking, though, that during the high flood season, the ancient peoples inhabiting the savannas of Mongpoche in Colombia, Llanos de Benibaure in Bolivia, in Janos del Orinoco in Venezuela, would engage in a lifestyle and a pattern of travel, intercommunity visitation, and exchange by canoes, far more similar to that of Caribbean seafaring natives than that of their own continental lifestyle during the drier summer season. In short, in oceanic islands, humans have no choice of where to locate dry land based islands, but at the same time, and in terms of lifestyles, there are many parallels to be found between islands and continents and islands and oceans. As Paul, as Paul Rainbird has argued, it pays off to intellectually decenter the land from, quote, island, end quote, in favor of an archaeology of the sea, and more specifically, focusing on maritime society. He addresses the fundamental question of whether there is something special about island archaeology in terms of approach, method, and interpretation that sets it apart from continental archaeology, to which he answered, quote, a qualified yes. But for the most part, no. It is mostly negative because we've been asking the wrong questions and therefore debating the wrong issues, end quote. He argues that a fruitful approach to an archaeology of islands must have, quote, at its heart a requirement to conceptualize coastal peoples, whether living in an island, boat, or continent as members of maritime societies, end quote. The effectiveness and the ability to engage in inter-island social interaction depend, of course, on seafaring technology. In the Caribbean, such as technological know-how is a given precondition, since it's clear that the first human colonization of oceanic islands from the continent, continent was, quote, not accomplished by swimming, end quote. The potential for inter-island connectivity and thus interaction in the Caribbean was there since the first arrival of human groups some 6,000 years ago. Technological improvements, however, can affect the properties of the web system. For example, increased efficiency because of less energy expended in propelling the vessel, less travel time, larger vessels with larger or heavier loads, and so forth. The web pattern is thus a model, a two- or three-dimensional spatial figure configuration of nodes interconnected by pathways or vectors. Nodes, at a macro scale, are land-based islands. At a smaller scale, these nodes are the coastal settlements, the ports of departure destination, with intermediate staging points in the flow of people and goods, and semi-icons between islands and in the to and fro movements between the coast and various points inland. Such nodes, particularly seaport sites, can be envisioned as attractors of humans and other things flowing through the web system. It is of interest to know what is attractive or repellent and why. Some might see portable artifacts flowing in a web exclusively as autonomous, indivisible entities mediating between humans, as the things through which interaction is further qualified into transactions, negotiations, and gift exchanges between human beings. And this is so, but I will also argue that the pre-Columbian natives of the Caribbean understood the interaction between objects and humans, and also the exchange of objects between human beings in a rather different light than contemporary post-industrial Caribbean islanders and Westerners do. Here, the native's perspective of a, of a multinatural, cultural, and animistic world, a feature of Tainones, contrasts with that of our current understandings of cosmos as a multicultural natural domain. While contemporary people might consider an object as an indivisible entity and as having an individual nature, 
The Tainoan societies and other Caribbean natives most likely perceived these objects as having multiple natures for which there was a unique integrated cultural interpretation. It matters then that we sort out what are the intrinsic characteristic what are the intrinsic characteristics or properties of the entities, i.e. people or semi-icons, flowing through a web because these will condition and define where and how interaction takes place, context, what the transaction or exchanges entail, relations, and how they are affected, causality or agency. So I think after this we are done with chapter three. We are. And um, it looks as though we're about at the hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and stop right here at chapter four for us to pick up on um, in the next video.